and welcome to The Climate Show with me, Tom Heap. This week, we focus our lens on miracle cures for our energy ills, mermaids' tears littering our beaches and moving photography of our environment under siege. How do they all stand up to scrutiny? Our civilization is pretty much powered by burning stuff. It's a sad truth for those fighting climate change, but 80% of our energy still comes from gas, oil and coal, sparking everything from cars to planes, power stations to central heating. A fuel that delivered that potency but lacked the pollution would be a godsend. There is one and it's driving a new dash for gas, hydrogen gas. The UK has a £240 million hydrogen fund and the EU is promising £8.5 billion to source this most desirable molecule. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe and in one form it falls from the heavens and splashes on the ground, held in water as H2O. And that stream of tiny bubbles is pure hydrogen. On the other pencil, there's a little bit of oxygen coming off as well. And this is just by adding electricity to water. So, in some ways, making hydrogen is pretty simple. Away from the lab and closer to the forecourt, the same chemistry is happening here. Here we have our hydrogen electrolyzer that produces our green hydrogen on site. Um, in here is the process room. We take tap water straight from the mains and purify it using this unit here. It's making hydrogen to deliver just over the wall to a filling station. You can refuel in a couple of minutes, get a range of over 300 miles, and all that's emitted is a little water as the hydrogen and oxygen recombine. Really nice car. Quick, quiet and a decent range. But the problem for hydrogen cars is the number of fueling stations, only around 11 public hydrogen points around the country. Whereas, for their competitor for the future, electric cars, 50,000 plus. And also, there's the opportunity to charge them at home. So while private cars are turning to the electric highway, it's the big boys who are hitching up to a hydrogen future. Buses, especially where cities are driving down air pollution, and construction vehicles as builders seek to hit low carbon targets. Our business model for now is to go more into trucks, buses and fleets that return to base because we can have one refuelling site. Hydrogen is also being touted as a new jet fuel. This week, Rolls-Royce trialled a hydrogen jet engine, albeit on the ground. And steelmaking also has its eye on the H. But these are both massive energy users, and hydrogen is bound by some inconvenient facts of physics. Breaking it from oxygen in water requires huge amounts of energy, which, to be climate-friendly, must come from low-carbon sources like wind or nuclear, already much in demand. It's also harder to handle than fuels we know. You can't carry it in a can. The tiny H2 molecule can leak out of existing gas pipework and it's incredibly voluminous. This tank can hold just 32 kilos, the weight of a large dog, enough to fuel up just 30 cars. Well, one company has developed a cunning new way of using hydrogen that doesn't need a whole new fueling ecosystem and it can even work on your classic old white van. Tom, do you want to put the bonnet up and we'll see what's uh, under there? Well, it looks just the same as any other diesel engine I've opened up. Well, and practically it is and it does and it should. Um, the only difference really with this is it has a couple of extra components. We've got a, a, a plate-type generator which generates the hydrogen on demand in the engine um, and a control box. It's sort of in headline terms, what do you think this delivers for us? Well, it dramatically improves the emissions of, of an existing fleet of vehicles. So, so you know, the benefits are there on the existing vehicles rather than having to replace and renew uh, at, at huge cost. This technology is far from zero carbon, but Fusion Blue aren't the only ones who believe the near future for hydrogen is as an additive. This lab is working towards adding hydrogen to big lorry engines with a £1 million test engine with a special quartz glass cylinder allowing researchers to analyse how different mixes of fuel affect combustion and reduce emissions. 
We want to use a zero carbon fuel in existing engines so that we can have a much faster immediate carbon reduction for transport sector. So we need to look at the hydrogen combustion process to help improve the hydrogen engine efficiency. Hydrogen may have a bright future, but as a regular fuel, it's a long way off. So, a brief glimpse there of some hydrogen tech. Let's hear now a couple of competing visions of its potential. Panacea or bit part player. Well, to flesh this out and really chew over where the hydrogen is our kind of energy saviour for the future, I'm joined by Claire Jackson, who's Chief Executive of Hydrogen UK, the trade body representing the business, and also Michael Liebreich, who runs his own business and advises on clean energy. There is some talk about using hydrogen within heating for our homes or the, the, the businesses and buildings behind us. Michael, does that work for you? Well, so there's 32 independent studies at this point um, that looked at hydrogen versus electrification, heat pumps and district heating and a few other things. Not one of them, these are independent studies, not industry studies, not one of them has found a meaningful role for hydrogen in heating. But yet the government is still considering it for heating, aren't they? Well, I think the government has, um, it's going to decide, I believe, in 2026. Yeah. I think what we've got is the government didn't want to just turn around and tell this massive industry that's spending lots of money lobbying that it's a simple flat no. So they haven't done that yet, but it's coming. Have you given up on hydrogen for heating? <laughs> Absolutely not. Heat is one of the hardest areas that we have to decarbonise and we need multiple solutions. Um, heat pumps are fantastic technologies, but they're not suitable for every home. District heating is a fantastic technology, but it's not suitable for every home. And we need to make sure that we have optionality. So in some areas, heat pumps will be more cost effective than hydrogen. In other areas, hydrogen will be more cost effective than heat pumps. Give me an example of where hydrogen will work better for heating than a heat um, pump. So, for example, in a home where there's no space for a heat pump, um, where there's no space for hot water storage, um, where um, there's particularly poor fabric efficiency and it's very expensive to upgrade, hydrogen might be a better and more cost-effective option than a heat pump. When it comes to making hydrogen, particularly green hydrogen, it is enormously energy hungry. And if we're talking about replacing a lot of industrial uses of hydrogen, which you sort of have some agreement on between you, yeah. we're talking massive amounts of you know, turbines or yeah. nuclear power, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. So we're going to need a lot of hydrogen, which is going to need a lot of renewables. We also have other ways of producing hydrogen by capturing carbon from natural gas. So we have multiple sources of making hydrogen. But the other important thing is when we look at this from an energy system perspective, um, you you know, we use an awful lot of energy in winter and not so much in summer. And hydrogen's a really good option for balancing that system. So you'd store it in the summer and use it in the winter? Yeah. The other, the other aspect is that um, we move probably about you know, two, three times more energy through our pipes than we do our pylons. And if we're going to try and electrify a decent chunk of transport, trying to electrify the entire of heat as well, put absolutely insane pressure on our electricity system. So utilising hydrogen alongside heat pumps um, will result in a more affordable and resilient energy System. But it's pretty difficult to put hydrogen through the existing gas structure, isn't it? Because it's such a tiny molecule leaks it's, out. It's actually not. Um, there are studies that have been done to date show that actually it's perfectly feasible and technically feasible and economically feasible to run hydrogen through the pipes that we have today. And that's because we've gone through a process of changing out our metal pipes for plastic pipes. When you combine these these things, the, the, the energy needed to make it, and also the, there is some complexity, as you say, in, in handling it, do you think it works as a large-scale solution? Do you think these things are credible? Oh, definitely. Look, it's an industrial gas and it can be handled, it's handled all over the place in the world already, industrially. The issue is really you don't want hydrogen in the homes. It is um, being portrayed as, what is it, keep the, keep the boiler, change the gas, um, but you've got to change the boiler, the hob, the oven, any uh, heaters that you might have, and it is a difficult to handle industrial gas. It also produces nitrous oxides when you burn it. So this is just something we don't want to do for all sorts of reasons. And just a very quick one on aircraft, if I may. It's being suggested as a potential fuel there, but it is incredibly bulky. And we saw a tank that was almost the size of a tank on the back of a conventional tanker, which held 32 kilograms of hydrogen. Mm. You know, it, it doesn't seem plausible for aircraft. 
Um, so in aircraft, we'll probably be using liquid hydrogen um, rather than sort of compressed gas hydrogen, which means that the volume required is much smaller. It's still more than the conventional jet fuel today, but it is um, smaller than It's a very heavy gas. thing to contain it as liquid, don't yeah, you? Yeah, for sure. But it's still, there's very few options that we have for um, jet fuel. And hydrogen is a really good option that's being explored by Airbus, by EasyJet, by Rolls-Royce and the jet engines. It's a really promising technology in that area. Briefly plausible for flight? Absolutely not. Um, short haul aeroplane, one third of it taken up by liquid hydrogen. But the really, the fun one, we need system thinking here, right? Liquid hydrogen, how do you get it to Heathrow? You're not putting it in a pipe at minus two, five, three centigrade, right? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna bring it by um, 3,000 liquid hydrogen tanker trucks per day, or are you gonna liquefy it in Heathrow with the sort of electricity demand that is produced by a whole big nuclear power station. And, and I mean, it's just not been thought through. In the end, we're talking about such a big scale thing. As we say, 80% of our energy is dependent on fossil fuels. I think you'd both agree. Replacing that with hydrogen is just an epic task. I mean, I don't think that anyone is suggesting that we're going to replace 80% of our fossil fuels by, with, with hydrogen. But hydrogen will have a key role to play alongside electrification. These two things need to work together to deliver net zero. So what's being suggested is about 20% of the energy system replaced by hydrogen. The right answer is probably about 2%. OK, there's a difference. Michael Lee Brack and Claire Jackson, thank you very much. Now, from one source of clean energy to another, and it's time to answer one of the many questions you've been sending in. On the Sky News app, William asked, why can we not have solar panels on every council house and private houses too? If they agree, the incentive would be much more free electricity. Well, the issue here is that they may generate electricity for free when the sun shines, but they're not free to install. The Energy Saving Trust reckons they cost about £5,500 for a typical domestic rig that would put out around 3.5 kilowatt hours maximum. That's when you've got a lot of sun during the summer. Now, that amount of energy is enough to run most of the electrics in a typical home, but, of course, we don't all live in the summer all year round. There are times when the clouds come over or, indeed, it's winter. So it doesn't generate for you all the time, so you still need electricity from the grid. It certainly helps in terms of your bills and in terms of climate, but it's finding that money up front, which is the key both for individuals and, if you want this as a national policy, for the government too. Well... When you think plastic pollution, bottles or bags probably spring to mind, less known but potentially worse are these. Nurdles. They're tiny pellets used in plastic manufacture. Every year, more than 50 billion of them are thought to enter UK waters and now a global nurdle hunt has found them on almost every beach. Sky's Aisha Zahid reports on what are known as mermaid's tears. While scouring this beach in lime kiln, it doesn't take very long to find nurdles. They're tiny pellets of plastic used by manufacturers. But spills during handling and transportation mean instead of ending up in our plastic products, too often they're washing up on shore. We're on this beach and we're standing on what we're dealing with is historical nurdle loss. And um, I would say that lots of the nurdles here have been here decades and they're washing up, maybe being dragged up from the bottom of the first or fourth and deposited, or they're just sitting in the bank. If you can look at this um, um, pot of um, nurdles, this isn't even a collection of nurdles of people picking them up with tweezers. This is handfuls of just um, the beach being picked up. So we want to um, ask why is no one accountable for this pollution on our beach that we're having to live with every day. Children are playing amongst it, wildlife is ingesting it. Where responsibility lies isn't clear, and that's because there's no regulation on how nurdle spills are managed, despite their environmental impact. As well as just looking not very nice on a beach um, and smothering beaches in plastic, unfortunately a lot of nurdles are mistaken for food by a lot of marine animals. Animals such as seabirds, fish, um, dolphins and baby turtles. Um, as well as this, nurdles can carry toxic pollutants on their surface, um, transporting na nasty chemicals around the world as well. 
The problem continues to grow. This year's great global nerd or hunt held by the environmental charity FIDRA found more of the plastic pellets on beaches around the world than ever before. Hunts took place at 317 sites in 23 countries, and nerdles were found in 90% of these locations. The only country where no plastic pellets were found was Indonesia. But could we see these numbers improve in the future? Environmentalists are hopeful if legislation is brought in. We need to see nurdles uh, classified formally as marine pollutants so that they are packaged more stringently, they're labelled more clearly and the presence of pellets on uh, ships is communicated to the operator so they can be stowed below deck in a more safe and appropriate manner. They may be small, but there's no doubt that these nurdles pose huge problems. Once they're in the environment, they're incredibly difficult to clean up. So focus needs to be on preventing them from getting there in the first place. Aisha Zahid, Sky News. Now, here on the show, we're always keen to keep an eye on the amount of energy that's coming from renewables as it gradually increases across the world and here in the UK. Well, let's have a look at this week. You can see wind here generated around a quarter of the energy in the last week, of the electricity, technically, I should say. And it also seems that wind is enjoying a bit more of favour within politics as well, with the business and energy secretary insisting that wind projects could be built onshore if there was support from the local community. Well, a poll commissioned by Renewables UK suggests that that might not be as much of a problem as folk think. It found that 76% of people support building renewable energy projects in their local area. And that number actually rises to 81% among people who voted Conservative in 2019. There are now an increasing number of projects where local residents can buy part of their own wind turbine, and these are known as community wind farms. The community energy wind farms are wind farms that are owned by communities. Now, they can be geographic communities, but in Ripple's case, we enable people from all across Great Britain to come together and collectively own wind farms. It's allowing the community to get involved in, um, in saving the environment. It's really important with energy that the project, the wind farm or the solar park, is located where the resource is better. That's probably not going to be in the middle of a city like this, but we think that even if you live in a city or a town, you should still be able to own your own source of clean power. Now, all these people around me they probably don't live near anywhere that's suitable to put a wind farm up or, or a solar park. So we enable everyone, no matter where in the country they live, to own their own part of a wind farm and get it supplied to them via the grid. Will he bring forward amendments to the energy bill to empower community energy schemes to sell their power directly to local companies and customers? The Honourable Gentleman uh, makes a very good point, and I know my right honourable friend will be very happy to take that conversation forward. Often the most powerful messages about climate and environment can be conveyed in a single frame, one moment in time captured by a camera. The Environmental Photographer of the Year Awards have just been announced and here to talk us through some of the winners is the competition's founder, Terry Fuller. Terry, tell us, why did you set this up? We want to tell the most important stories that we're ever going to tell about our planet. And doing that through imagery is a really powerful way of appealing to people's hearts and invoke action. Well, we're going to have a look through some of your top award winners in a moment. We're going to start with the one that was the Youth Award winner, which was uh, some flamingos here. And we've actually managed to get a little interview with the man who took the shot, Fais Khan. Just being nominated alone was, um, was an absolute honour. And to actually uh, win the award from people who care so deeply about our environment is just, like, it's more than a dream come true. 
I would hope to use my photography as a tool to help people to think respectfully about our environment and try to make a change. And I think these images, not only taken by me, of course, by all the other contestants, is a very good way of inspiring people and helping them think respectfully about our planet. Fies Khan there. Well, Terry, let's have a little look around our, our virtual uh, virtual gallery here, starting with, with a couple over here. Incredible image at the top, this one of nature kind of taking over. Yes, it is fascinating. Um, I mean, we see two sides of the coin when it comes to, to nature and nature recovery. Um, we see the fragility of nature and um, in, uh, against the impacts of climate change, but also the resilience and the ability to recover. And this illustrates that, I think, quite nicely. There's a kind of sci-fi movie feeling about the top one, and I have to say it appeals to me. Yeah. The bottom one, a lot more destructive, but really powerful as an image. It is really powerful, and particularly when you get to the story behind it. I mean, tragically, 49 people lost their lives in that explosion that's portrayed in the image there. But in addition to that, the explosion caused a huge amount of disruption in terms of pollution as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's have a look at some images over here. Some of these are a little bit more kind of futuristic, if you like. Um, uh, we, we've got this one of, of the sort of future of, of agriculture, maybe, this uh, vertical farm. Yeah, it's particularly exciting because we've tried to nudge the competition over the years towards showing us the hope and the solutions to uh, climate challenges and building climate resilience. And this, this certainly illustrates that. And I particularly like it because we know as a global population we're going to move more into urban environments and city living. And this gives us opportunity to actually produce food in those types of environments, not necessarily out in uh, the rural landscape. And then this, this bottom one I love, it's that kind of fa fashion for cold water swimming and getting in the environment, but also, of course, wind turbines, low carbon solution in the background. Indeed, yes, and of course wind turbines are nothing new, but what we liked about this image is that these, um, this wind farm was produced out of a cooperative with the local community. Yeah. So there's a real connection there and people have bought into that. Great, well, let's have a look at the big winner now. If you take a step back over there, we can, we can have a look at it in our, in our central image here. Um, <laughs> A flamingo, but rather a, rather a sad story. What is the, uh, the narrative behind this? Well, this picture is taken in um, a, a nature reserve in Iran, and it's a particularly important, internationally important reserve, teeming with wildlife and, and rich ecology. The story here is, though, that through uh, land management practices and uh, reduction in water available in this wetland, uh, these birds have um, died through um, inhaling and uh, consuming toxic materials. It's such a juxtaposition, isn't it? Because we think of flamingos as one of the ultimately sort of beautiful and slightly fragile, slightly otherworldly almost. And here, well, they're suffering because of our world and what we're doing to it. Well, indeed, it's a majestic creature and it's been reduced to that. And I think it's, that alone makes us wonder about our place in the world and what we're doing to the natural world around us. Well... Terry, thank you very much indeed. That's great. And I'm sure the viewers can look at this by looking for the Environmental Photographer of the Year. Thanks so much for your time. Well, this week's Climate Cast has more on the pros and cons of hydrogen power that we were looking at earlier. You can download it from wherever you get your podcasts or if you scan the QR code on the screen right now, you can listen to the latest episode. Well... That's it for The Climate Show this week. Don't forget, we'll bring you the latest every weekday at half past three here on Sky News. But for now, goodbye.